Спасибо большое. Дорогие друзья, Dear friends, we need to continue our work. Uh, lunch is not a good factor for continuation of work. It's hard to choose intellectual work over lunch. Well, some simply skipped meals. Most of those who are in the room skipped lunch, I suppose, without giving in to this temptation. This is our second session of Zinoviev uh, readings, and it is an important topic, in my opinion, because it is connected to the attempts to implement the alternative scenarios. Well, this was the Soviet project, we were part of it, and the Chinese project, which still uh, continues. China, during its last Congress, once again recorded the goal for the Chinese society, building socialism with a Chinese face. So the alternative is there in a country with a population of about 1.5 billion and 5,000 years of history. We cannot simply ignore such an alternative, no matter how some might want that. Why do we even turn to the alternative projects that were quite successful? Even the Soviet project was successful until a certain moment of time. And the Chinese project borrowed a lot from the Soviet project and was using its momentum. If we recall Marx, who was also mentioned here, we need to know for sure that Marxism is a theory of a capitalist society. Marx wrote the theory of capitalism, and there is no theory of socialism, unfortunately. They may say, oh, it's not true that this book has ideas about socialism or that book. But many presenters of the first session turned our attention to the fact that all these attempts and theories have this uh, post predicate. Nobody can talk about positive content of those theories. We live in the at the time of post everything, post uh, capitalism, post industrialism, post socialism. But what is in the present? Todor Todorov. Uh, uh, was talking about Ibansk Bay being time. Where are we there if post for us is so important? This problem has been with us for quite a while, ever since uh, the USSR was still there. From my point of view, the helplessness of the humanities in the Soviet Union in the late Soviet times when Secretary General of the Communist Party, Comrade Andropov, had to say it directly. We don't know the society that we live in. The helplessness of this humanitarian knowledge is the continuation of this principle which is based on post. So we need to look at the projects that were quite successful and that are still being implemented and that claim to be an alternative to reflect on what it was, what it is and what is possible in principle. We can keep 
talking about an alternative idea. We can keep talking about an idea of the future and it's not there for a number of decades. Our country disintegrated partly because of that temptation that creeped in here. There was this inadequate behavior of the elite and there was the behavior of the Soviet people and they were all tempted to go back like to the civilized the course of development. We were told we were going back to civilization and this temptation as an idea matched perfectly the emptiness that the Soviet humanitarian disciplines could not give the people. Another remark, why China? In China they studied really carefully the reasons of the disintegration of the Soviet Union and all the experience that comes with it. In China they chose another way because they had our uh, sad experience in front of their eyes. Of course many people say today that well there's no socialism in China they have capitalist economy in the morning Mr. Todorov said that capitalism will conquer the world and then there'll be bankruptcy. But has it not conquered the world already? So that's what we're talking about, westernization in the terms of uh, Zinoviev. The world is conquered by capitalism. it is stuck. There is no room for any further extensive expansion and now we, we can observe its consequences every day. The future is today and but I'd like us to start with two presentations from uh, Mr. Maslov and Mr. Sergeyev, and we will start with Sergey. It is a great pleasure to speak uh, in front of this professional audience. My time is limited, and it's a good thing because. I won't be able to tire you. Let me focus on five points that describe the development of China today. The new Chinese project has been going on since 1979. It will turn 40 next year. Uh, you, uh, the People's Republic of China was formed in 1949. So 1979 when they had the plenum of the Central Committee of the Communist Party, then Saopin said that the previous years were a terrible feudal and fascist dictatorship, and he announced the beginning of reforms. Forty years later, I returned from Shanghai the day before yesterday, and there was this conference with our Chinese colleagues, and we discussed the fate of Kasigin reforms. Yes, you are quite right. China does monitor carefully advantages and disadvantages of the Soviet mo uh, model. But this was just a preamble. The first point is originally China uh, was based on national nationalistic development. The Soviet Union tried 
to implement Western institutions and wanted to become more Western than the West, China never tried to mimic or become part of the Western model. Yes, they borrowed a lot. They borrowed system of education and they uh, got their energy or from that Western model. And after the Opium War in the middle of the 19th century, when China was occupied by foreigners, the motto was very simple to use the foreign things for the sake of the Chinese things. The core was Chinese and they used all Western things that they could borrow for the development of China. And that's what defined, determined China. And this nationalistic trend has been going on for the last 40 years. In 2013, they declared the Chinese dream motto, it's everywhere on the walls of the buildings, in schools and universities. It has no specific content. If you listen to what the Chinese leadership say, it's the dream of restoring the national dignity of China and the presence of China within global economic system. It is true, people who study China carefully, especially China before 1950s, they could say one interesting thing. Starting from 3rd century AD, China was a manufacturing country. China was recording everything by province, by district. They had the books uh, and when we started to study the economy of China, not just Confucius, it became clear that in different times China produced from 15 to 30 plus percent of the global GDP and controlling 20 percent of the global trade through the Silk Road. Of course, the Silk Road did not belong to China only. The main language there was Farsi, of the main language of the Silk Road. But still, China was the main manufacturer of those goods. When China disappeared from that process from the middle of the 19th century until 1970s was the, was the bug in the program rather than the norm. And now China is returning to that principle. They talk about they talk about One Belt, One Road initiative and this Chinese dream idea. So my first idea is Chinese nationalism. My second point is that China originally had to economically, not politically, be integrated. No financial or support pro-American, anti-American, no alternative to the 80s. And that's the first contradiction that was formed. We have the national model of development with the American help and support. If you read Kissinger recalling how it used to be, there was this great illusion that China will gradually be integrated into the US model, not just using dollars, but using loans from the World Banks, from the Asian Development Bank controlled by Japan, and thus China will be supplying to the world, to the US, relatively cheap products, but still being at the periphery of controlling global finances, but will be a relatively advanced manufacturing countries. And this model was preserved until 2012-2013. Then China decided to change the model. And this is my third point here. And changing the model is painful. China, for the first time since 2013, offers an alternative to the global development. It's the first country after the Soviet Union that offered a new world model. 
whether we like it or not, whether we follow it or not. That's the one Belt One Road initiative. The principle is quite simple. There are many documents published, and the principle is quite simple. China offers other countries to follow it, joining the One Belt One Road initiative. China is willing to invest into infrastructure, roads, development of communications, new technologies, 5G networks, and so on. In return, China asks loyalty to this Chinese model. This is what China did with Hans in 3rd or 12th centuries with local princehoods. The political culture is quite stable in China. As soon as China is rich enough financially, as soon as it has an army and some political weight, they begin to use this model again. We give you money, you show us loyal loyalty. In the 3rd century AD, China spent 60% of, of its GDP to support the princehood. And that's what happened in the Soviet Union. And, but back then, Chinese, uh, colla China collapsed. Now China is going back to the same rates of growth. They promised to invest $250 billion dollars for, to the, into the countries that signed One Belt, One Road initiative. In reality, they invest only one-tenth of that. They need to invest ten times more, but still China gets these friendly neighbors. And today, and it's an important point, China views the world not as countries, but rather as regions. There is a special policy for Central, for China there is no EU. They have a separate model for Central Europe, for Western Europe, for Central Asia. They have a separate model for Southeast Asia, ASEAN, and uh, to Russia and nearby countries. They have their own model for Ukraine and Belarus. Uh, in other words, they model the world according to regions because it's simpler. And the model here is quite simple, yes. By 2013, China became powerful enough, enough foreign reserves to offer the world its alternative. And the alternative is how parallel financial institutions are created based on this Institute of Asian Infrastructural Investments with the headquarters in Shanghai, the new BRICS bank where most of the shares are with China, uh, One Belt, One Road Fund and so on. This is where you can use national currencies, RMB and national currencies, where you can trade and such contracts are offered to others quite actively, including Russia. Another part of this model is this neo-colonial model when China goes to other countries with their factories and plants. We study that they don't build new industry, they use M&A, merger and acquisitions. They acquire companies that work successfully. That's for Latin America, for Africa, but the GDP of the country where China invests decreases rather than grows. The number of jobs decreases. China optimizes financially and makes local economies less sustainable or stable from the social point of view. It's this extrusive uh, model, investments and taking out the added value. The China doesn't want to repeat mistakes of the Soviet Union. There are many articles published about that. The Soviet Union invested a lot but did not get a lot. China is training, by the way, we can look at scholarships and tell which countries are important for foreign students. They allocate more scholarships for Kazakhstan, for Latin America more than for the entire Central Asia. 
This model offered the alternative for the first time. And my uh, fourth point, as soon as China stopped being a global manufacturing site, measures were taken against it. This is a well-coordinated attack against the China from the US. China uh, is now among some unfriendly neighbors. The community of countries of common destiny may disintegrate because, because countries that lived or survived only by Chinese investments will try to look for a new model. Some are drifting towards the US again. And the important point here is the role of Russia. I'm not uh, taking the spotlight from my colleague, but psychologically, if we look at the models offered by Russia towards China, Eurasian pivot, or the pivot towards East or Asia, China does not accept these models. We live in our own world. These are great things for scientific conferences, but they are not discussed in China at all. China does not look at Russia from the point of view of models that Russia offers. Russia is part of the Chinese model. There's a certain concept for Russia designed by China. It did not change from the 19th century, from the middle of the 20th century. And in this sense, since China offers an alternative and Russia offers no alternative for the world, the conversation is impossible. The countries are not equal, not in terms of economy, but in terms of the models of development that they can offer. We can. And there are other suggestions, but they are not really welcomed by China. China is at the crossroads. The China, China has no time to regroup. They have a Lenin-type party, it, which will not disappear. The ideology is under control, and only through this unity of the party, China may be able to find the way out from the situation. Unity of China, unity of governance is still intact. Thank you very much. And what you spoke about, how the authorities in China preserve the monopoly. It's a monopolistic authority in China. On the one hand, it's a, Ch it's a Chinese imperial tradition. On the other hand, it's learning the topical experience, because it was clear how the main mechanism of the Soviet Union disintegration was not the economy, not the economic crisis, but the crisis of the government. The center of power committed suicide, freeing, leaving this vacuum for those who wanted to. Now Timothy is next. Let's start from the point where my colleague stopped. China is our competitor, of course. There's no friendship politically or economically. There won't be any friendship like that. Well, uh, instead of joining One Belt and Road, they started talking about coupling or connecting. But you cannot couple them because China doesn't just require loyalty. My colleague will correct me. China wants to have everything of China where that Silk Road would be. It's like the continuation of the territory of China beyond its borders. And then you have to be loyal because it's a reverse scheme to Chinese rail, to when we had our railroad in China. They have want this uh, 
Chinese Eastern Railway in reverse. We won't allow that to happen compared with China. We are late in terms of uh, designing things which may be good or bad, but China has a problem. It, it, it was uh, part of the mechanism called Chimerica. Chimerics. Uh, China was given some capital, engineering, scientific knowledge, that's capital. Uh, money is not capital. And you cannot buy capital for money. We cannot buy any true capital. We wanted to buy Opel. It didn't work. Not to mention something else. China was given this capital at the same time they got the sales market, but with the requirement to give the revenues back to the West. They were using the same treasury bonds of the US that we did, but on a different scale. We have to understand that, yes, we are competing with China, not just the US. This is how this multipolar world looks like. We need to keep our sovereign strategy. I'm not I'm not saying we need to do the opposite to what China does. In reality, we do what we can. We simply lack understanding of ourselves. We are discussing present, past and future here. It's a reflection. China had more of this reflection and we won't be able to immediately switch to this uh, uh, mania for everything huge. And nobody gave us anything. We borrowed from no one. We earned what we have ourselves. They cannot take it away from us, starting from gas and energy vectors, but not just that. We have some industrial capital in the sense. Of course, there's this uh, Marxism, dogmatism. We confuse uh, terms and but a lot is already clear. Capital is the scientific knowledge that can give you an advantage in economy, allowing you to concentrate resources. There is capitalism, where capital plays the key role and there is the market. My colleague said that until the middle of the 19th century, China was the main manufacturer. It was the, a big market as well, because there was no capitalism, and it reached some limits of its growth. Capital in the economic history was always used to break the borders of the traditional market, to expand it, to offer new products that never existed, for which there is no demand or supply. This is the role of capital. Whether we had capitalism or communism or socialism, Trotsky criticized the Soviet system. Let's look at it quickly. Trotsky was murdered but after that, Tony Cliff wrote in 1949, he wrote about the uh, system of in the USSR as the state capitalism. It were different from China. We had science, we had engineering. Some projects got preserved since the uh, pre-revolutionary times. Our, we built our own industrial potential. 
and we were ahead of China in that sense at that time. So this capital was monopolistic. We were using the uh, the state was controlling that capital. We had a unique economy with huge monopolized capital, but no market. So this capitalism was out the market. And here I disagree with you, Dmitry, that the USSR disintegrated only because of ideological reasons. They tell us we were not producing things. It's not relevant. Our level of capital concentration was not in line with the domestic market and what we could afford externally. Beyond the borders of your country, you can only trade in the area where you can guarantee your political influence. Yes, starting from the 1960s, we began to introduce purely market-based uh, ideas that you need to increase consumption, that you need to give people what they want, that we wanted to take over the USA. It was not communism for sure, even though at the same time the same person, Khrushchev, who st started that, uh, resurrected the communist myth, trying to use it for management, because it was strange and it did not work. All those dissidents and this internal corruption of the top of the Communist Party was because of that. The program was not realistic. That's why we lost the political monopoly. And then we uh, approached this market, not the capitalism. We had capitalism because it, the capital was highly concentrated. We were missing the market to diversify contacts and management of economic activity so that m more operators make decisions. And that's why we are different from China. We can use this uh, topology. There are countries from former communism who uh, still have state-run economies, but they did switch to market like Cuba or North Korea. And there are countries like China and Vietnam. And there's a third group, Russia and Ukraine, who did uh, switch to market but lost the former ideology. Of course, we will be able to afford large-scale economic projects and economic interventions when we restore the state ideology. I'm sure we can do that. Much like China, we, we are a historic state as opposed to the U.S., which is ahistoric, as they have to invent things all the time. This is the situation we are in. And my final point, what was our social experiment? OK. The, there was no power in Russia. And we got that society theory and began building of power, the government, based on research-driven approach on science. And it was quite possible, the scientific knowledge is quite efficient, it records certain ideas than the historical tradition or canons. At the same time, scientific knowledge is limited because it proceeds from the fact, but it has, it is always challenged. It keeps losing its credibility, not just uh, truthfulness. We ended up 
in the situation where our starting scientific ideas were not up to the reality. Because there's no there was no theory of socialism and it is still not there. And the, here's a, a, a situation. Scientific knowledge is not enough to manage a social structure, especially of civilizational scale. It is impossible to do without religion. They had to invent the religion uh, and they had that kind of religion invented as uh, atheism uh, declaring that man is God. Atheism is also a very strict uh, uh, monotheistic religion saying that man is God and only man is God. We had Dostoevsky and Bulgakov who wrote about it. We turned this religion of man as God as the real tool of uh, social governance. And now we want to borrow a slightly different religion of liberalism. The same religion of man as God, but in a market situation. It also says there's only one God, the human being, the man. And that's why we need to be very critical about it. We know how the society works like based on this short-term religion. China, I'm not sure about China's religion, it is based on more traditional religious structures, not on something that just uh, it was just invented. We have a very clear religious structure true Christianity it has to stay and we need to stay away from experiments in modern religion which is actively imposed on us by our partners and then perhaps we'll be able to get to the next stage of economic development which is quite possible thank you somebody asked uh, about uh, the problems of atheism. If Stalin could talk now, looking at what happened, he could say, when you have a social project and it's based on scientific knowledge, which is always challenged and criticized, if you cannot, you can, you don't have to refute it or revoke it, but you have to challenge it all the time. But on the other hand, you need to build a dogmatic faith in communism, for example. And you, you have this discrepancy, this contradiction that you cannot overcome. Between dogmaticism in a social structure, there's a problem, yes. If you could prove that non-dogmatic faith is possible, we would have things to discuss. Faith is faith because it can only be dogmatic. And that's your assumption. All right, all right, all right. Let's give the floor to our Chinese colleague. Perhaps you could uh, speak up about what we were talking about here, China, Russia and how to find the way. Hey. Uh, I'm listening very, very carefully. Uh, yeah, I work as a small company and uh, two company. One company is a refrigerator uh, equipment project uh, company. I work in Russian from Far East, Magadan, uh, Kamchatka, 
Sahalin, Vostok, until now, you, uh, uh, Russia East, Moscow. I visited Crimea twice. I visit Sevastopol, Sifilobar, Theodosia. For what? This is my job. My job is work on refrigerator project. Uh, in the other hand, I uh, have my personal uh, culture company. Uh, I work on this company for about 10 years. I organize all of the world um, painting. Uh, sculpture, bronze sculpture Dali, Saro Dali, Ili Pablo Picasso, Ili uh, last year I designed a uh, 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 very famous German artist uh, uh, Netherlands, Netherlands uh, in Russian Embassy in Beijing. Why I introduce myself? Because during working uh, on Project Hallidinic, I must encourage myself, encourage my team working very, very carefully. Because all the project consists by many, many parts. Commercialer, Winding Sadler, Kending Sadler, many, many parts. This job encourage myself, my team must, must be working very, very carefully. During working, I encourage my culture team think what? Uh, this is three famous uh, economists. I respect you very, very much because I'm proud of, I'm from China. Yes, now China have a problem. Yes, now China have a, a little high level economy. But uh, I'm never work for the government. I only uh, organize uh, in this year, I establish Alexander Genevieve International Culture in Beijing for what? Because from Alexander Genovieff's uh, clinic book and the idea, I study a lot. Because uh, Alexander Genovieff encouraged people, encouraged Russian people, encouraged all of the world people must criticize by ourselves. Why? Criticize make a conclusion. If bad, change. If good, keep. Also, uh, uh, Alexander uh, Genovieff's philosophy idea is very useful, is very fitful, uh, also uh, useful all over the world. I, I never regard Alexander Genovieff as a Russian philosopher. I regard him as our Chinese philosopher because the idea is very, very big similar. Uh, now I want to talk about Chinese Kung Fu. Kung Fu uh, from here until I think 2,500 years ago. In Kung Fu, I only talk about two uh, Kung Fu sentences. One sentence. Kung Fu said in his, uh, in his book, Kidai Yazik, uh, in English, it means that when three people working, must be one people, one man is your teacher. This is means uh, every neighbor, every nationality, every country can study from each other. This is uh, very similar. Alexander Genovieff in his uh, book, uh, he encourage people uh, study from each other. The other confused the sentence he said, Kidai Yazik, uh, in English translation, everyone, every day, must uh, think 
yourself very carefully. Morning, afternoon, evening, make a conclusion. If good, keep. If uh, uh, wrong, it's wrong, then change. Because Alexander Genovieff, as a philosopher, he encouraged people to criticize each other, criticize himself. For what? For encouraging people to study, study, study. Uh, this is why I want to uh, connect Chinese Kung Fu with uh, Alexander Genoviev. I regard him as Russian modern Kung Fu. Thank you. Спасибо, спасибо большое. This was a strong point, and you have to be even more careful in culture than when you work with refrigeration equipment. In reality, I am very serious about it. Mikhail Khazin is here, and perhaps he could discuss the topic that you, uh, you focus on professionally. Whether the red project, the left project is still possible, the left idea is still possible. You cannot discuss it. This is a bad pessimism that it's not for us. Let's remind each other where the Red Project came from. The theory of global projects that we invented together with Sergei Gavrilenkov in the early 2000s is based on some basic ideas. The global project is an idea that is offered to the rest of humanity as a kind of bright future. The word project here means not that somebody is building it, but rather that this idea is rich enough to structure human society for its implementation, which is already not so trivial. All global projects until the 16th century were built on religious ideas be it Christianity or Islam or Buddhism. And in the 16th century, for the first time, there was a global project built on the denial of this conservative biblical uh, system of values, the capitalistic uh, uh, project and they banned, they cancelled the ban for usury for interest on loans, and and also that happens when the tribal system disintegrates. In the tribal structure, the decision about whether it's good or bad is made by the elders. If it's within one tribe, it's one elder. If it's a discussion between representatives of different uh, tribes, then two elders come, meet, and say, you were right and you were wrong. As soon as you get cities, it, you have to develop the rules of living together. and. And these values are no absolutes, but everyone knows what is good or what is bad. There's this unified model of values. In the 16th century, related to interest and loans, it was cancelled, abolished. By the way, in the 16th century, 10 years or 15 years after, in 1517, Martin Luther nailed his thesis to the doors of that church. I forgot the, the town. In 
the Netherlands, they got their banking legislation. No matter what they uh, write in the books on economy, there was no banking legislation until the middle of the 16th century. And it could not exist because the law could not protect the interest on loans. And then it turned out that the biblical system of values without the loan, uh, the interest on loans does not ensure social stability. Thus followed the religious uh, wars in the 16th, 17th century, blood, corpses, and in that situation. In the 18th century, there was another Western global idea based on the principles of freedom as the right of any person on their own, his or her own system of values. That's when all the entire modern liberalism comes from. And there's this idea that we need to ban the interest and in loans again. But modern centralization cannot exist without loans. It's reducing the risks of manufacturers. And then they decided, OK, let's, uh, let's keep this interest rate. The, but then uh, we will not allow others to uh, own it. It kept developing, and by the middle of the 19th century, Karl Marx was the first who understood that to extend cap uh, for extensive development of capitalism, you need expensive development of markets, and the land is finite, and the capitalism development will stop. Immediately he got the idea about the end of capitalism, and entire Marxism is an attempt to explain how post-capitalistic world will look like. It has nothing to do with those structures that were the foundation of the USSR because the USSR was born before the markets became global. Marx thought that pro proletariat revolution could be successful only when capitalism exhausted its opportunities to expand markets. And we have only now approached that point where, according to Marx, we could have had social socialistic revolution. That's why the entire description of the USSR in terms of classical Marxism has no connection with reality. That's why Leninism is a separate page. And that's what Stalin said. He said we need the new economic science, otherwise we will be conquered. And that's what actually happened. I'm not going into those details now. I can only say one thing, thanks to the existence of the USSR, capitalism made one serious mistake. That's how it happened. Using Reaganomics, they raised the level of life of the population much higher than that the economic model could provide. In the US of today, the expenses of in the golden billion countries citizens spend one-fourth more than they get. Look at the scale. In 1930s, when the crisis started in the US, households spent 15% more than they were making. In other words, the crisis will be two times stronger than the 1930s. And at the same time, there will be complete destruction of the middle class, because the middle class was invented after 1981, after economics, by loan uh, stimulus of demand. And this is not the topic of uh, our today's conference. I'm almost done. the uh, destruction of the middle class will immediately lead to the restoration of the global projects based on social justice. And there are three areas here. 
the nationalistic, capitalistic projects, the religious, Christian or Islamic projects with some extreme notes, and the red project, the communist project. Then we recall about China with its concept of three forces, that any configuration should be divided into three parts rather than two parts. If two forces are passive and one active, then the one that's active is wins. And then if two active are and one is passive, then the one that's passive wins, like uh, China won during the, this uh, clash between the U.S. and uh, Russia. Today, nationalistic forces are active, and we see the rise of fascist movements in the West and East of Europe, because they will have to do something about those migrants. We see Trump who is nationalistic in terms of ideology. Or we can see the rise of religious ideas. ISIS was the false start, but there, there will be more. Two forces are active, and the third one, the communist uh, force, is uh, passive, and it will win if we look at the Chinese logic. Uh, Mr. Maslov is our expert, and I'm just uh, an in someone who interprets the situation. In this situation, the key question is how exactly this red project will be winning. I can tell you how. It's the only one that can offer you the alternative model for economic development based not on time based consolidation of capital, but based on solidarity. And this key idea is developed by Sergei Belikov, present in the room, to and other comrades. How is our institute called? Institute of Eurasian Economic Union. I believe that Zinoviev Club needs to deal with this topic. I understand very clearly that only eight days left until the elections in the US, and after those elections, the Western global project will uh, be very bad, and there will be changing uh, changes in the public life in the US, in Europe, and Southeast Asia, and in China, because the entire development of China is based on external foreign markets, as opposed to USSR, which was uh, uh, which uh, was developing based on its domestic market. That's why it's disintegrated. But China is developing based on foreign markets, and it cannot compensate. And it's a real pro problem. They don't know what to do with it. And there are no schools of thought in China that would do that, because e economic schools in China are copies of American liberal schools. The only country in the world that still have political economy, and partially Japan. Japan and China dislike each other for well-known uh, reasons. This is the way when the Chinese can say we will never forget or uh, forgive. But, and this is our advantage, competitive advantage. Russia has the alternative economic thought. Neither in geography nor anywhere else. That's why we can offer China our own concept, not now, but when it becomes clear that to it, is, it no longer works to support the economic growth in China. But we need to be ready for that. As today we have the potential to offer something, but there's nothing to offer. That's what we need to proceed from. That's a clear concept. Still, this 
horse is strong enough and it can move on. They think about it, but they don't know what to do. I have two more people. In China, time is cyclical. The most successful Chinese civilization is the Tan Empire. The Tan Empire, ideologically, the Tan Empire was the union between the nomadic tribes of the Great Steppe and China and is fertilized with Nestorian groups of Central Asia. Of Presbyter John from uh, Europe. The Chinese remember that and that's why Xi Jinping May met the patriarch twice, but understood quickly that uh, Russian Orthodox Church is not the source of the blessing. But the problem still stays, and we need to deal with it. Then we'll have this alternative economic school, Mikhail, Mikhail Dimulin. We cannot really stop with the expansion of his project, taking the time of other presenters. Say what you want to say. I will be talking about purely Russian projects in its current state and its future state from the historical and cultural point of view. It's not easy. But there's hope, and the hope is that even though capitalism occupied the world, it did not conquer the mines, it did not conquer them in Russia. Any project begins with mines, with ideas, begins with ideology, and this is our first difficulty. There's no ideology in our constitution, and that's a formal thing. In our constitution, there are many things that uh, are envisaged in the constitution but is not implemented, and vice versa. But there was a time when our leaders said that the foreign policy of Russia is purely pragmatic, it means it is not based on ideas, and in our foreign policy there is no ideology. In reality, this was not true, and starting from 2007, the impact of ideas uh, got manifested in the Russian foreign policy, but there was this temptation to misinterpret Russia from our opponents. And this misunderstanding of Russia was the reason of crisis in 2013-2014. Westerners thought, okay, if Russians had no ideology in foreign policy, and at the same time they were talking about their growing responsibility in foreign affairs, and this was the main idea of uh, uh, the uh, talks of our foreign minister and president in the UN, perhaps they will be responsible for showing this responsibility for our own ideas. Because when you are responsible internationally, you implement some ideas. As our allies uh, well, could ask the question, where are we allies? What are we allies about? And when we said we are allies as we defend our sovereignty, smart people would say this answer is not enough, because sovereignty is just a tool. Sovereignty is a tool. And then uh, what we got in the early noughties, Russia said that they were a country that wanted to be sovereign or respected, but 
res respected participant in the Western global in the Western global project. But why would this? allies uh, be participating in the Western global project through Russia when they could get connected to the West directly. This would be more pragmatic as we taught our uh, partners to be pragmatic in foreign policy. The question of the project is the question about the subject of historic activities and there was a lacking and it is still there, but the expert community here uh, notices the strengthening of orthodoxy. Liberals are becoming more liberal, conservatives more conservative, uh, believers are more insistent on their faith, and atheists deny believe in God more actively. Russians want to be more Russians, but they don't understand how. Let me say again, this strengthening of orthodoxy after the ideological vacuum is only natural, it's the pendulum effect, but it's the right thing. A lot is said about environment today. Envir ecologists emphasize that system survives if you preserve the diversity of species and when the species disappear, disappear it's the first sign of uh, catastrophe. The same with countries. This str the strength of internationalism not, is not in the refusal of national feeling but in, in being careful about it and respecting it in uh, ourselves and others. Unification, imposing of one political or cultural standard would be the way to uh, the demise of uh, mankind. If we talk about the main contradiction of today, I would formulate it as a conflict between forces of globalization on the one hand and those who favor national identity of nations on the other hand. That's very brief. and. You can develop and discuss it in greater detail, but this is the point of this controversy. That's why our leaders cannot help uh, responding to this, to this concentrated expression of the conflict. And they understand you don't just protect the interests of Russia in the globalizing world, but you need to counteract the process of globalization. And Vladimir Putin, as he spoke, uh, in Valdai, he said that there is this task that requires specific heroism. Uh, it's about fighting the destructive consequences of globalization. It's a significant step forward that opens up some better prospects for the Russian project. And the Russian project is uh, designed to play its important role in a broader project for the entire country of Russia. I know I, I ha And this diversity, this diversity of the Russian project until recently, I used to criticize this um, uh, term uh, Russiania as opposed to Russians, Ruskia, but I felt that that this diversity is what makes us strong. National diversity multiplied by cultural and historical unity. And there's one positive feature here. President Putin uh, used the uh, prophetic approach about, as he worded the Russian project. What we are not, we are not uh, globalizers, but uh, in that sense we are anti-globalists.
the positive content for the Russian project. That's what they've been discussing for a long time. But there's another aspect of this Russian project uh, mentioned by Olga Zinoviva. It's about humans as the driving force of any project. No project can be implemented if the Russian, if there is a Russian uh, person, then there will be this Russian project, and it has to be the new Russian person, and they would be different from Russians under the Soviet Union, like they were different from Russians of the 19th century, or those were different from Russians of Peter the Great times or Catherine the Great. They were different in terms of mentality. They had all this binding link. What was that common thing that they had, which was the result and the foundation of cultural inheritance and self uh, self uh, reviving system. And there was the system of fathers and sons, of inheritance. They tried to break it in the 90s and so on, but in the, they s found this vulnerability. They uh, wanted to uh, create this uh, contradiction between the generations. And this Russian church became part of this pro-Western work. Uh, if you dislike your own father, the previous generation, how can you respect your uh, father in heaven? Let me remind you of one story. Abraham never crossed the border of Palestine until his father died. The father brought the tribe to the border. Until he died, he was a pagan. Abraham already had the revelation of God. He knew where to go, but until he buried his own father in an honorable way, he did not move. They tried to do that. It did not work. And the columns of immortal regiments testify to that for everyone, for believers and non-believers. In my opinion, the main component of the Russian project is the restoration, full restoration of this feeling of sonship, uh, sonhood, and developing the traditional family as a survival tool in today's world. It's the foundation of faith and loyalty. Let me emphasize again, the new Russian person is possible, and the true Russia is not in the past. The true Russia, the true Russian world is ahead of us if we are worthy of this task. Thank you. This line was quite important that human beings live in several generations and otherwise they cannot exist. I learned about that from our next speaker, Iskander Avalitov. He studies this very carefully and he will tell us about how previous forms are manifested in human beings. Yes, uh, well, I can start now, right. As I try to position myself in this discussion, in a sense, I will continue Timothy's idea that it's not about going somewhere with our suggestions and projects. We need to increase the amount of understanding. It's not about some creative ideas, but 
about understanding that I, I thought I would be opposing to Hazen who tried to explain the global projects that are going to win or lose in the sense that economic theory he says that these global projects are based on different economic ideas that this is wrong and then I shall try to continue what Demurin said the driving force will be this new Russian person my first point in any project there is a very important inalienable part why we do something okay we want to create something we want to build something but why what's the big meaning of what we do we do it for what or why when we ask these unpleasant questions in reality we don't have convincing answers we start explaining how it will be useful to somebody but usually it's not very convincing and this plan this aspect how reasonable or logical all those projects are this is a fairly complicated topic first a few uh, really simple memories from my Soviet life approximately in 1980 I was the postgraduate student at the physiology department I started the transfer of impulse from the nerve to the muscle tissue and we were using we were using the frogs and their muscles all my friends were involved in that uh, my colleagues are approximately 200 people in the world all together as I was this uh, postgraduate student I kept asking this question why are we studying this this particular muscle of the frog why do we study it what for they used to say something but they were not really convincing and I kept asking this question and my uh, scientific advisor a well-known researcher and he asked me is this true what they're telling about you about all your weird questions I was concerned thinking that but I also had some hopes will you give me the answer yes you will get an answer he said he said we scientists in general in, in our school in particular it is banned to ask these questions use this word banned to ask this kind of questions either you do keep on doing what you're doing or look uh, for another company I'm thankful to him actually for his sincerity and he pushed me towards other topics not just uh, the transfer of signal between nerves and muscles but how now shall we live and then I was a scientist I was also involved in many similar situations you have about five minutes there were different situations 
For example, we had a neighbor, he was director general of a big textile factory, and he used to sell, say that he did not understand why they were producing so many clothes that he knew for sure nobody would ever wear. I'm not talking about clothes, but about this question, why? Timothy said that at the top of the Soviet society there was this division, this separation between political program and slogans, but it's even worse in my opinion. Uh, the very question why, the meaning of what we do, what is it for, why is it? It was not the question that they asked often, and it was banned, as my scientific advisor said. But it was the self-imposed ban. I gave you these local examples, but from my point of view, during the late USSR, we won the war, we restored the country, and in this late USSR, there was this problem about what we do as a country all together. This is what Timothy started discussing. What is the ultimate purpose of what we do? If there is no question like that, and there is no clear answer, then evil, even at the level of everyday life, it makes no sense. You cannot live intensively at all times with all the bright colors, unless it has some meaning. All right, this knowledge, why, is a very important part of culture. In our school of philosophy, we call it the ultimate ontology, this ultimate idea about ourselves that gives us this meaning and our soul is at rest, and we don't want to keep asking this question again and again, why, why, why? So this ultimate answer that stabilizes everything, personally and in terms of uh, public life and life of the society. When we discuss this ultimate ontology, we could ask ourselves a question, why did the communist utopia not work in this function of ultimate ontology? We did have some system of ideas, uh, what they called scientific communism. I think if we ask ourselves a question about these ultimate meanings, we need to understand one thing. A human being, if he is a born in a culture, we change. We don't have any constant nature. Human beings have consciousness, not just psyche. Consciousness, that's something that allows us to change any programs that are part of it. it. Allows us to move somewhere. For us, the human beings, the most intriguing part would be the questions about what we are and what we might become. Uh, 
this is how we could characterize briefly what we have. On the one hand, we have communist utopia. Marx said that communism is in the development of tribal uh, forces of human being. What are those economic uh, forces, tribal forces? And this humanitarian part of the communist project was uh, not developed, and that's why it was so. Uh, it was not successful eventually. We spoke about democracy. From the humanitarian point of view, it's a very poor idea. I'm free in a free society, and I implement my potential, but that's a mm, failure to understand the fact that it's about culture, not the man himself. From my point of view, if we talk about some finite ultimate ideas and, and meanings, we have pretty good legacy. First of all, Christianity in its most traditional and orthodox form. There's this original sin, and then originally uh, this human nature should be overcome in the canon itself, in this deification idea, there's this huge horizon that we need to use by preserving what Kulikov was talking about. It does not mean the revision of Christianity. All right. I also think, and it is very important, this is a historic framework. What the world, what, that's what our president says. Why would we need the world which, where there is no Russia? We need to be part of history and we need to do everything for that. And the third point, not the ultimate, but the working ontology started by Hegel and developed by our post-Marxists. Marxists. The idea of logic, the entire world is the implemented thinking. If we build a new thinking, new mentality, methodology and so on, through that we will have huge power and the whole world is in our hands. All right, thank you. I'd like to thank all participants in this discussion. It was very meaningful. I am going to leave this discussion with many questions that happened after the first discussion when our colleague said that communism is unity. It's about the words. Globalization, is it unification or not? We are offered this total world. Somebody says we are against globalization. We are with the Chinese. And the Chinese tell us we have our own globalization scenario that you will like of the same kind of unification. And we are unhappy. There's one and the same word, unification. Let's imagine it's all about unification, communism globalization in the old sense, globalization in the new Chinese sense, it's also about unification. There's one word, the, there's one word, but there are different worlds behind it. In that sense, what Askander finished with, if we start being very careful about how we think, and how it is happening, what we think, then we'll find new words to find some real meanings behind that. 
the third discussion will be in the presidential hall according to the agenda. Thank you very much.